<laughs> Ready to go. You fireplace on? Can you, you see you the fireplace? Hot? I'm fine. Okay, um, go. Turn it off. Let's go. Good morning, Denver Church. What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Three, two, one. Good morning, Denver Church. <laughs> Good morning, Denver Church. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, so three, two, you guys can smile, it's fine. Three, two, one. Ten. That's why I said, why didn't dance so you can see the I'm ready. Voice. I'm ready this time. I'm ready this time, I promise. Here you go. Three, two, one. Good. <laughs> Good morning, Denver Church from the Pless family. I'm Anna. I'm Abby. I'm Elizabeth. I'm not telling you. Good morning, Denver Church of Christ from the Pless family. I'm Anna. I'm Abby. I'm Alyssa. I'm Jared. And I'm Larry. If you're like our family, I'm sure 2020 has presented some unique challenges, and I'm sure we've all learned a lot. I learned I can't breathe through a mask. My son Evan learned that you can take a bath every three months, and it's more than sufficient. I learned that it's possible for BTS to chart number one on the Hot 100 Billboard. And I learned that the Plus family really missed their son Jerry during the holidays, and I was kidnapped back in November. Can I go home? Yeah. And I learned that being stuck inside with your family of five for nine months is just as fun as it sounds. But as much as we joke around right now, we also want to remember a couple things as we head into the new year. One, please take, please take some time to, uh, to reflect back on 2020, some of the things that made you smile, some of the things that made you laugh. And also, please take our vision of hope into 2021. And here's a special message from the other member of our family. Hi, my name is Jared, and Happy New Year's from Okinawa, Japan. Welcome to 2021! <laughs> I don't like the end, so we're going to do that. <laughs> Alright, so more energy, more! Let's go through Good night! Good night. <laughs> Wait, but we don't have to restart every time. Yeah, I'm restarting this time. Just I want to start from where you Okay, I'm just saying we don't have to. I'm just saying! Yeah, I'm just saying! And I learned... Hi, church. For this morning's scripture reading, we'll be in the NIV, reading Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Enjoy the service and Happy New Year.
Hello and welcome to Church Online with the Denver Church of Christ. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you. And to all of you, Happy New Year. We did it. We closed the books on a very difficult 2020. I'm personally glad it's over. But I realized something last night that made me nervous to do uh, to do this sermon. And it's that 2020 and everything that happened, part of it might be might be my fault. You know, for my entire life, my, I have a very strong German connection in my family. And there is a tradition that good German men and women follow every single year that the first thing they eat at the New Year, as soon as the clock strikes 12 and it's a new year, Germans are supposed to eat herring as the first thing that they eat. It's it's a fish. It's, to many people, it's disgusting. I don't mind it, but for my entire life, you know, my parents, the first thing that they would feed us as the as the new year turned would be would be pickled herring. And I followed suit when I left home. And so my, you know, every year, as soon as the clock strikes midnight, I, I have I have pickled herring to ring in the new year. Except for last year. Last year I didn't do it. When it turned to 2020, for some reason I forgot to get it and and I didn't have herring. And and look what happened. And I don't know if there's causality there, but I can assure you this. This year, I definitely had herring. And um, so I'm hoping it goes better this year. And I hope that you have an incredible year in, in 2021. It's hard to believe that a year has passed already. And as long as that year has felt, it's still hard to believe that it's now over. It's, it's difficult to account for the passing of time. In one moment, it seems that you're a child running and playing, unaware of the many cares and concerns that weigh upon the lives of those in that far away and distant land called adulthood. However, in what seems like the span of heartbeats, you are aging and you are unable to slow that quickening pace of life and you are in awe of the children that you now see who look with wonder at the smallest curiosities in the world. And all along the way, we each leave our mark little reminders that we are here and that we are alive. Some, without, with thoughtful tenderness, place their impressions upon the events and the places and the people that come and go within the scenes that they're graced to play, while there are others that scar and blemish the backdrop of the world wherever they go in their heedless pursuit onward. We live with the legacies given to us, and we leave ours behind for others to receive. The hope of individuals and the hope of nations wax and wane as a result of those legacies that get left behind. Now, we don't get to choose the world that we inherit, and rarely do we have the choice of how the world turns while we're in it. And yet, we're still responsible for the legacies that we personally leave behind. We need to ask ourselves if we want it to be a legacy ruled by visions of dystopia and cynicism. Or would we rather leave behind aspirations for better things and a conviction of hope for the future world, for our children, and for theirs after them? And if it is the latter that we desire, then it begins with what we say and how we say it, in the home, in the car, with our children in the back seat, and certainly within social media. We have to stop ripping everything apart because it's flawed. We are all flawed, and everything that we create is the same. It's the most pervasive form of self-destruction to seek out and dismantle everything that offends our sensibilities without having a genuine interest in understanding the intent or the objectives of those that have offended us. Unless we want, a few, unless we want future generations to trust nothing, to believe in nothing, and to destroy everything that's not perfect to them, we need to start conducting ourselves with intentional grace and genuine goodwill towards everyone. Those are the conditions in which ingenuity and community and a belief can take hold and flourish within a people. We have to hope again and then hold on to that hope with unswerving determination. Thus, during this new year, we want to teach a better way to think and a better way to react than to give in to doubt or negativity. Additionally, we want to use this year to teach people to think about the hope, the true hope that they already have as believers and how that hope can change the way anybody approaches every situation that confronts them from moment to moment. We want our theme for this year to unfold like a story. 
Thus, each series that we have every month will describe an aspect of that story. Now, the story is, of course, one about hope. In January, it would only be natural to start with the beginning. So once upon a time. Now, for those of you who are following our service from a computer or a mobile device, I'd like you to volunteer your favorite books or movies or songs about hope in the chat section right now, and then feel free to comment on what others wrote. Now, when I thought about this for myself, I thought about, okay, what in the last year has brought me hope? And it would be the book, I wrote a book, a nonfiction book called The Wounded Healer by Henry Nowen. But I also read a novel called The River Why by James Duncan. The movie that I saw in the last year that brought hope was Mr. Rogers. And the song that brought me the most hope this last year was Don't Throw Out My Legos by AJR. Now, I look forward to reading your suggestions in the chat. Now, near my writing type table at all times are a few books that I constantly consult. A few different books on grammar, a couple different thesauri, and the complete Oxford English Dictionary with its etymology. Words and how they are used are all very, very important to me. In some ways, I have made a life out of the use of words. This is one of the reasons I thought it was important to begin a year discussing hope by first addressing its meaning. But to do that, we're gonna need to dip in, we're gonna need to dip our feet into what some of you may consider to be pedantic waters. I have to make a distinction between the literal meaning of a word and the intended meaning of a word. Because literal meanings of words change and they migrate and they transform through the decades and through the centuries, while intended meanings remain fixed in a moment. So what I'd like to do is take a word that has changed over the years as an example of what I'm talking about. And so the word I wanna start with is the word chauvinism. Now the origin of this word comes from the Napoleonic Wars, specifically from a fabled individual whose name was Nicholas Chauvin. Nicholas Chauvin was supposedly a decorated soldier and a war hero. He was a staunch supporter of Napoleon. Napoleon used Nicholas Chauvin to demonstrate as an example the way that he wanted all of his soldiers to be. Now, Nicholas Chauvin avidly supported Napoleon even after the latter was deposed and sent into exile. This resulted in later French theatrical acts and vaudeville acts to use the character of Chauvin to comedically depict extreme nationalism or patriotism as something that often flies in the face of reason or common sense. So the word came to mean a chauvinist was someone that was fanatical about their nationalism, a fanatical patriot. The word, the word was largely obscure until it got picked up by a movement in the 1960s, the feminist movement. There, they used the word to depict extreme male patriotism. They sort of changed the use of the word from being someone who would have been maybe an American chauvinist or a French chauvinist or a Soviet chauvinist to be someone that was a male chauvinist, an extreme patriot for the male gender. Now, somewhere along the line, this imagery and this definition began to transcend the actual meaning of the word, so that the prefix male is often dropped today. Today, if you are regarded as a chauvinist, it's assumed that you are a toxic male, not just a comically patriotic person to some nation or other. And what you can see is that there now exists a great distinction between the literal definition and the modern intended meaning of the word chauvinist. Now, the point of this exercise is to show that words themselves have a storyline. And it's important to have a grasp on the history in order to understand the word itself. And the word hope is no different. When we say the word hope in English, we all have a slight variation upon what we mean when we say it. When we each use the word, we all have a slightly different emphasis or intention behind the use. And that's just when we're talking about one word in one language. The Bible is mostly written in two languages, ancient Hebrew and Greek. The English word hope is therefore translated from an ancient Hebrew word from hope and an ancient Greek word from hope to the English word for hope. Well, that is sort of what happens. Actually, there are several different words in both Hebrew and Greek that can be translated into the word, the English word, hope. Kind of. 
Sometimes a word that it's translated to hope is used in English as hope, and sometimes it isn't. You know, for instance, in the Hebrew, sometimes we translate a certain Hebrew word to the English word wait, as in to wait for a bus. But sometimes that same Hebrew word is translated into hope. In a different instance, we may take a Hebrew word and translate it into the English word trust. But somewhere else in the Bible, we'll take that same Hebrew word and translate it into the English word hope. It completely depends upon context upon the patterns of the author, or upon the agreed-upon intent of a written statement within the Bible. Now, for us, the problem largely is that God never wrote a dictionary. God never invented a human language, as far as we know. And yet, we also know that he spoke the universe into existence with words. What we have in the Bible could be described as a record of God's intent, miraculously transcribed into a human language. But words change, and human meanings evolved. But God's intent has never altered. So when we look at the concept of hope in the Bible this year, we're not just trying to define how a human word gets used. We are trying to understand what God's intent behind such a concept is. Now, go ahead and open your Bibles to Romans chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 12. We're going to begin to look at how the difference between the literal and intended meaning of hope can affect how we understand what God means by hope. And we're going to do that by looking at this first passage. Now, this passage in Romans was written by Paul, who was a Jewish teacher, but he's writing in the Greek language. But in the passage that we're about to read, he is quoting from the prophet Isaiah in his book. Now, that book, the the prophet Isaiah, that book was originally written in Hebrew, but Paul is using the Greek translation of that Hebrew language. And the thing I want you to remember as we read this passage is that the word trust, like we said, and the word hope were sometimes the same word depending on what language that was being used. So in this passage, two different Greek words are being used, hope and trust. Those aren't the same word but they're being translated you know, as hope and trust. Um, what's important to remember is how intertwined those two concepts of trust and hope have been already throughout Scripture. All right, so let's go ahead and open to Roman, Romans chapter 15 and verse 12, where it says this in verse 12. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. All right, so that is... You know, that's the quotation that Paul is uh, is using from the book of Isaiah. Now Paul is going to continue on in his own words, okay? In verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Paul asks that the God of hope will fill his readers with joy and peace. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think to myself, that, that sounds nice. And of course it does. But what we have to ask ourselves is what is really going on here? As I said before, the word trust or belief, depending on the translation, and the word hope sometimes have the same Hebrew derivation when we're, when we're reading in the Old Testament. In this instance, we have to read about hope as something that is linked to our trust or our belief in God. Now, why is that important? Why is that important to realize as we're reading this? Well, because the author of Romans, Paul, is trying to settle within this letter to the Roman church ongoing disputes between Jewish and Gentile believers. Now, these two groups of Christians, they love each other, of course. They know they have to if they're going to follow Jesus. That's part of the deal. But they're not seeing eye to eye on some things, and their disagreement is getting fractious at times. Throughout this book, throughout the letter to Romans, Paul is telling the Jews that while the word of God, the law, may have originated in their nation, it was only so that it could eventually go out into the entire world and into the Gentiles. And then at the same time, Paul in this letter is telling the Gentile believers that while they are equal heirs to the kingdom of God with their Jewish brothers, there is a special honor that the Jews have in being eldest among siblings, as it were. And the Gentiles would do well not to disparage that. 
Now, Megan and I have just finished up, let me transition here. Megan and I have just finished up our first complete year with the Denver Church of Christ. And we've seen our fair share of divisions within our fellowship the same way that Paul did. The divisions that we saw were sometimes between different political ideologies, between those who have different views and how we should conduct ourselves as a church during a global pandemic, between people of different cultural backgrounds and ethnicities, between people of different generations. Now, we are never going to see the end of disagreements or divisions within people outside and inside the church. And if the goal of the church was to get everyone to agree on these issues, we would be faced with a nearly impossible task. Now, the thing is, I don't think that was Paul's intention when he's, when he's writing Romans chapter 15. More than anything else, Paul is telling the church in Rome, and this is where I believe that we also have to listen. As he's preaching to the church in Rome, we have to, we have to see ourselves in what he's saying, right? This is where we need to listen. But he's telling them that the church in Rome, that they need to put any personal desires, opinions, or intentions behind their first allegiance to the kingdom and to God. Their first trust has to be in God. Because when that is really true, then true Christians will honor one another and love one another in spite of their differences. If our hope doesn't come from God above anything else in this world, then our conflicts with one another and our conflicts with the world will eventually consume us. So in the case of this verse in Romans, the intent of hope isn't simply to give everyone the warm fuzzies of joy and peace, but that through a genuine trust in God, believers can live together in a joy and a peace that gives hope to the rest of the world as it overflows out of that Christian community. Now, last week I said that in 2021, we can do better as a fellowship. And this is one of the areas in which I believe we can do so much better this next year. To be more clear, these are some areas where we can repent of our sin as a group. We can be better to one another despite our differences. We can rein in our own opinions so they don't overshadow what should appear to be our first allegiance and our first hope to God and the kingdom. We can decide it's better to be slighted, it's better to be insulted, it's better to be misjudged than to risk doing the same to anyone else. We can stop putting the imperfections of others on public display while vigorously disregarding our own imperfections. We can be less self-righteous. We can be more unapologetic about our love for church and our love for fellowship. We can do better. And through that, we can overflow with hope to the rest of the world. The above, the above verse in Romans underscores two things about this coming year that we should remember. First, that the future of our fellowship and its strength will rest in each of us truly making God's promises our very first hope in this world. And secondly, we're going to have to wrestle with finding that hope from moment to moment and from situation to situation in our own personal lives. I think one of the verses that best demonstrates that struggle to hold on to hope while living in a fallen world comes from Psalm chapter 42. Go ahead and turn to Psalm 42. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God, under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Miser. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All of your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? 
Why must I go about mourning and oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? My soul, why are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, and my God. This last verse sums up the whole of the psalm in many ways. Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Put your hope in God. Twice in this psalm, David asks of himself the question, why are you so downcast, my soul? And and why is my inmost being so melancholy? Why? Now, I've been reading this psalm over and over again for the last couple of weeks. In many ways, this psalm is one of the most human commentaries in the scriptures to me because it's honest. It's very honest because the author demonstrates real human agony. He is probing his inner thoughts throughout the psalm, and he shows that he is self-aware. He knows what's going on inside of him. It's a perfect poem to sum up an individual's grasping at hope while the, while the world continues to rage around him or her. I think we all agree that circumstances should not and cannot determine who we are and what we're going to do as Christians. A mean world ought not to make us mean. Living in greedy, to- greedy times cannot justify our own greed. Injustice done to us does not justify unfairness in our own behavior. The author of this psalm adheres to this same thinking, which is why he questions himself over and over again. Why am I so downcast? The people around me may question my faith. My enemies, they may persecute me. My foes, they might be plotting, even at this moment, my own downfall. It might even seem that God himself has left me alone in the storms. He may have abandoned me. It may seem he's abandoned me to the sea where one huge wave after another continues to hit me, threatening to capsize me. And yet you see the author continuing to question his innermost being, as if he's saying to himself, of course these things are happening. You are living in a fallen world. But that does not mean that you have the liberty to submit to dismay or that it's okay to accept grinding pessimism. Now, the temptation to do so is completely understandable. The moments of weakness and of doubt are easy to accept. But this is not a way of life nor a mentality to abide within. Something I want to say to our fellowship and every individual within the church And something I want them to practice is this, resistance. Do not yield to this type of thinking. We cannot forfeit our faith or our joy, in essence, our hope, because of the world around us. To do so is only to admit that our faith is counterfeit and only useful when life goes exactly as we expect it to. Psalm 42 is not a psalm of Pollyanna evangelism. Psalm 42 is raw. This poem contains words of injury, of pain, and of woe. In these verses, David puts hard questions to God, and he doesn't ignore what's happening inside of himself. And yet, he expects something more from himself. He is determined not to to surrender. He disciplines himself to remember what is good and how God has been good. He remembers what he has in order to be thankful and in order to express that gratitude. As a result, he continues to challenge that sadness and that doubt and that cynicism that he has found inside of himself. And then he bends his will and he bends his thinking to trust God and put his hope once more in him. This is not a psalm of mindless optimism, and we should never use it that way. But we also shouldn't use psalms like this to justify any of our own entrenched melancholy or pessimism. When Jesus himself quotes Psalm 22, which similarly asks the question, why God have you forsaken me? He doesn't do so in an act of self-piteous negativity. He's acknowledging reality when he reads that psalm. Reality of his condition, 
of what he feels and of what's happening around him. And yet at the same time, he is quoting that Psalm. And in the same moments, he's asking God to forgive those that are presently torturing him. He finds in those moments accommodations for someone to care for his mother when he is gone. He gives hope to a thief who is dying on the cross next to him. He's not yielding to the circumstances he's in. He is overcoming those circumstances and he's giving rise to a revolution that we're still waging to this day. In those moments, Jesus gives meaning to the concept of hope. And then he asks us to give life to that concept in the world today. That wherever we go, hope overflows into the world around us as individuals and around our community. Let us now share communion with one another this morning. And as we each take time to remember Jesus in our own ways, we ought to reflect on all the ways he continued to give hope to others, even in the worst and darkest moments of his own life. And then we ought to question ourselves in this moment, knowing that Jesus now asks us to give hope to others with the life that we've been given and the life that we're living. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you. We're so grateful for a new year, for the opportunity to make things new. God, we're so grateful for the continual forgiveness and the continued mercy that we enjoy under your reign. God, right now, we take up communion remembering your son, all the hope that he has given us. As we take the bread, Father, we remember the way that he lived while he walked this world, what he gave to individuals, the hope that he spread no matter what was going on and no matter what he was doing or what was going on with him. Father, he always found the time to give people light and to to show them where to go and to show them that there was always hope. And Father, as we take up the fruit of the, as we take up the fruit of the vine, we remember the sacrifice that he made, Father, so that we could hold on to hope, so that we have, we, we have a hope in this world and the one to come, God. We of all people should be overflowing with hope because of what your son has brought for us and the example that he left for us. God, thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for having a plan to save us. It's in, it's in your son's name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. My name is Steve Hess, and I would like to talk about this weekend's contribution. But I want to do so by telling you a story, a giving story from the New Testament. The city of Jerusalem had just been through a traumatic day. Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, the teacher, had been crucified. And now, late in the afternoon, his body was still hanging on the cross. His friends and his family had all disappeared, gone into hiding. And the God who seems to have everything under control had left this until the last moment. He impressed on the minds of two men, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, that maybe they should take care of the problem. These two men were celebrities in Jerusalem. They were Supreme Court justices. John called them secret disciples, but on this day they would be secret no longer. They went to Pilate, asked for permission to take Jesus' body off the cross, and together they went and lowered his body and washed it and wrapped it in linen and spices. And then the decision had to be made, where were they going to put his body? Joseph had just had a new tomb made for his family dug out of the side of a mountain, incredible expense. And without another thought, he just took Jesus' body and put it in the grave and rolled the stone in front of it. And that's the last we hear of Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus. We don't have any idea what happened with them. We don't know what role they had in the church. We don't know where they lived. We don't know what they did when the government began to persecute the church. But we do know two things. We do know this, that valuable gift that Joseph gave Jesus on that day, he received back just three days later, slightly used, but significantly more valuable than when he had given it. And the second thing we know is that that tomb became a holy place, a sacred shrine. And Joseph's family must have been honored to think of being buried there. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if after the very first funeral and the first body was placed in there, that somebody went down there three days later and rolled away the stone to see if the body was still there. This morning we are on the very first Sunday of a new year. And I want to ask you to consider making a gift like the one that Joseph gave. If you're just an occasional giver, I want to challenge you to start 2021 with a new resolve. Now you can start 
low. You don't have to give very much, $10, $20. The amount is not the significant thing. It's the habit. And I want to challenge you to make a habit of giving. Every single time you get a paycheck. And let God take care of you. I guarantee you He will. If you're already a regular giver, then I want to challenge you to step up and make 2021 a significant year for your giving. In fact, I want to challenge you to give a gift that's so unusual that the bookkeeper wonders if you make a mistake, made a mistake. But give. And let me tell you this, pay attention after you give to what God does, because I guarantee you He's watching. Now, pray with me, and then the contribution. Father, thank you for including Joseph's story in our Bible, for blessing his generosity so significantly. It's something you do so very well. And Father, as you impressed on the hearts of those two men, impress on our hearts the need to be sacrificial in our giving. And turn this test into a testimony. In the name of our living Lord, I pray. Amen. And God bless you. Happy New Year. 2020 is finally gone. Let's hope for a better year this year. At this point in our service, I'm here to give you some announcements. First off, on January 23rd, we're going to have an all-church devotional on the value of using social media. Tony Fernandez, who leads the church in Broward County, Florida, is going to speak to us about how to use it to further the kingdom of God. Their church in the last three years has seen over 100 people become Christians because of their use of social media. And we too here in Denver want to learn how to use social media to further the kingdom of God. So please join us on January 23rd for that. The time will be determined soon. Following that devotional, we're going to have a leader's workshop. Also, our diversity committee here in the Denver Church of Christ has put together a workshop entitled Identity in Christ. How do you define yourself? Many of us define ourselves as Democrat or Republican, white, black, Latino, married, single. This whole entire workshop is about finding our true identity. Our identity is really in Christ. Michael Burns from the Minneapolis Church of Christ will be speaking to us about our identity in Christ. Please join us for that. Registration will be up soon. This will take place January 30th and 31st. And lastly, Hope Worldwide is putting together a food drive to support our local food pantries. Because of COVID-19, most of the food banks are serving families and people more than they have ever done before. Because of that, we want to help support them as they serve our local communities. Again, this will take place the week of MLK Day, which is January 18th, and we'll be doing this through our community groups. More details to come. And finally, what you've been waiting for this whole entire time, your random fact of the week. Do you know why airplane food tastes so bad? It's because you lose 30% of your taste buds in flight. That's all I have for you folks. I hope you have a great week.